we have Michael Forbes from WSU uh, talking about quantum simulations from cold atoms to neutron stars. Thank you very much. Uh, so this work is done with a whole bunch of collaborators. I'll come back to this, but the nuclear theory stuff is done with people at University of Washington. Uh, and then I have experimental collaborators, Peter, Lauren, talk to Sean a lot here. Um, some students, again, you can hear. And then calculations on the big supercomputers are done in Poland uh, with Gabrielle, who is online, and Piotr and some um, other people. Anyway, uh, how many people here know about neutron stars, what neutron stars are? Okay. What about pulsars, that pulsars are neutron stars? How about what nuclear pasta is? A couple of people. Okay, good. All right. So a few things. So uh, the connection here is uh, my sort of goal is to understand neutron star physics and using cold atoms as simulators for this. And so neutron stars form when you have a huge amount of matter that's in, usually in a, at the end of a supernova. It gets compressed. Gravity is pushing it together. And then the electrons are pushed into the protons. And some of those convert to neutrons. So you have a bunch of neutron-rich environments. And then neutron stars are ultimately stabilized because neutrons are fermions. And so there's a Fermi degeneracy pressure. And that keeps them alive. Uh, now, what they actually look like on the outer crust is a bunch of nuclei. These nuclei are still charged, and so there's Coulomb interaction. Uh, but these nuclei are starting to get more and more neutron rich. And at some point, then the neutrons are, can't be stabilized inside the, neutron, the nuclei, and they drip out. And so the picture in the crust of the neutron star is sort of in just this thin region on the outside, is that you have nuclei, but they're surrounded by a gas of neutrons. And that gas of neutrons is very dilute, and it turns out to be well approximated by the unitary Fermi gas in fermionic systems that you can form in the lab. And so properties of that, it's, now this is very dense matter, but relative to nuclear scales, it's very dilute. And it's also very hot matter relative to our scales, but again, relative to the nuclear physics scales, it's very cold. So it's degenerate, these neutrons will form a superfluid if you stir them. So neutron stars rotate, so that stirring happens naturally. You expect to form vortex lattices, and then those vortices can have interesting dynamics. And so some of the properties of a neutron star are then associated with properties of those vortex lattices. And the idea here is to try and capture all of this stuff um, through cold atom physics and see if we can explain what's going on here because nuclear physics calculations are hard. So the densest parts of matter in the universe <clears throat> are related to the best vacuums in the universe. And some of the hottest things in the universe are related, I'm gonna say, to some of the coldest places in the universe and these guys are unfortunately are really, really far away, uh, but the experiments are just down a few floors in Webster. Um, so uh, this is uh, very nice uh, because neutron stars are fun, but they're really hard to probe. Now, how does this all work? Well, there's some nuclear potential, which is very complicated, and there's interatomic potentials, and they're complicated in their own right. But the thing is, if the gases are dilute and you're looking at low energy physics, then you can ignore what's happening in the core of the potentials and describe everything if things are really dilute by a scattering length. And so this is sort of the universality. And it turns out that neutron matter has a very large scattering length. It's about minus 19 femtometers, whereas the typical range of interactions, et cetera, is on the order of uh, femtometers. And so it's an order of magnitude larger. And so this is very much in uh, this unitary limit that was mentioned earlier, where the scattering length is larger than other length scales. And the same thing can be done in cold atoms with uh, fermions like lithium-6, where you tune that scattering length with a Feshbach resonance and you make it dilute so the particles are far apart uh, again. So there's sort of this universality. Now, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close between neutron matter and neutron stars and cold atoms. And so this allows us then to use cold atom experiments as a proxy for neutron stars. Uh, now, fairly recently, there's been some nice observations of neutron stars. Uh, when they merge, they emit gravitational waves that are detected about three hours that way. Uh, as well as in a few other places. Uh, and so from, there's been a couple of two merger events from neutron stars. And when the stars merge, the gravitational fields cause them to swish a little bit and you can get some properties about their uh, compressibility, which tells you about their equation of state. And so you learn some properties about neutron stars from these mergers. And we're using these to try and constrain the nuclear physics interactions. So this is some work that we do uh, with collaborators here in the department and at UW. Um, but neutron stars have a lot more information than just the equation of state because they're rotating and they're dynamical. And they have these superfluids inside and the superfluids have vortices. And so there's a particularly interesting effect uh, that neutron stars that rotate produce. And what happens is a lot of these neutron stars have a hot spot. 
And so as they rotate, that hot spot emits light, and we see these as pulsars. And these things can spin, uh, I didn't tell you, but they're about 15 kilometers or so in radius. They have about one to two, not much more than two solar masses inside that radius, and yet they're spinning at milliseconds. So these things are really quite crazy objects. Now, typically when they're spinning, they're emitting electromagnetic radiation and gravitational radiation, and that takes angular momentum away, so they slow down. They sort of go beep, 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 beep. Slowing down continually, as you'd expect. These are not in binary systems, the ones that were these pulsars. Uh, but occasionally, they suddenly spin faster. And this is called a glitch. And where does the angular momentum come from? And so a picture that has been around for quite some time is that, the, um, that this superfluid inside is acting like a reservoir for angular momentum. Now, if you stir a superfluid, you get a lattice of vortex. So this vortex lattice, these vortices are quantized, the angular momentum is quantized. If you want to get rid of that angular momentum, these vortices have to move out. Now, if they're trying to move out, what happens, the re remaining nuclei in there, or a little bit further on you get nuclear pasta, might provide pinning sites. And so the vortex is trying to move past the pinning sites and it gets stuck. And so this picture has been around for almost, a, well, actually 50 years now, uh, that the vortices get stuck on these, the superfluid inside acts like a reservoir. It can't lose its angular momentum until enough vortices get pinned that one of them depins, sends a cascade, and a whole bunch suddenly transfer their angular momentum from the superfluid to the outer crust, and the star spins up. So these pulsar glitches are a transient phenomenon that we can see. They may also be observed later on with later uh, advanced, well, the A plus LIGO detectors. Uh, so there might be continuous signals from this. But we're looking at these transient effects and trying to see if we can explain those with the superfluid phenomenon. <clears throat> okay, so this is the Vela pulsar. It's one of these examples. This gives you a scale. They're very small glitches in terms of the overall frequency, but they're large on the scale of a star. So they're, they're involving many, many thousands of vortices. Uh, and then this is a calculation that we did. So we take a nuclear density functional and we try and look at the force that a nucleus exerts on it. And if you push on a vortex, it moves perpendicular due to the Magnus relation. And by looking which way the vortex moves around the nucleus, you can tell whether the force is attractive or repulsive, and you can measure the force. And so this is a calculation we did using a density functional that we believe works pretty well. But what I want to tell you is that we don't really know. Density functional is not an exact technique until you get the right functional. And what we really need quantum simulation for is to make sure that our density functionals are working properly or adjust them if we can't. Okay, so I'll come back to that point. Oh, um, neutron stars are really quite complex objects. If you go a little bit further inside, you have protons and neutron superfluids. The proton superfluids, of course, are charged, and so you get flux lines, so these are uh, like superconductors. It's a superconductor. And then you also have the neutron superfluids, and so the pinning might actually happen in that region where you have proton vortices and neutron vortices. So we're looking for ways to try and simulate these types of two superfluid mixtures where the vortices are one stiff in one and not in the other. Uh, and then as you go down, the nuclei start merging and they form various different pasta shapes. So this is what nuclear pasta is. And so again, that might provide interesting pinning sites, uh, might form a little crust, so a solid crust in there that might have some uh, star quakes and things that might be detected in gravitational waves. So there's quite a bit of interesting physics here. Um, <clears throat> and it covers a lot of scales. What? Oh, they, they're really cold. Yeah, yeah, everything here is cold. So all uh, relative to QCD scales and nuclear scales, basically everything is, is really cold. And this is, these are fairly old neutron stars. Okay, so in order to try and get to this, we need to go from some microscopic theory or calculations or quantum calculations, and that's what we're going to be talking about, to hydrodynamic models, vortex filament models, ultimately up to something that you can do on the scale of a neutron star. And so this is really large multi-scale problem, uh, but we need the right inputs, and that's where quantum simulation can work. <clears throat> so a uh, couple of examples of this. So cold atoms work very nicely. You've got a nice microscopic theory for some of these, but that needs to be tested. So I'll talk about that. In particular, something called the SLDA, superfluid local density approximation. Uh, precision measurements. Nice thing about cold atoms is you can mix them. So another system is, is helium. You've got helium, different phases of helium, uh, helium-3, helium-4. In principle, you could try and do superfluid mixtures there, but as Deep mentioned, uh, you have to get to really, really cold temperatures, so that's difficult. Whereas we right now have uh, two mixtures of hyperfine states, so superfluid mixtures can happen, both fermions, fermi bosons, 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 in cold atom systems. Uh, helium, you can get larger volumes, 
which is kind of nice. Uh, but there's also no nice microscopic description for dynamics of helium. We think we have one that's pretty good. We need to test it better for the cold atoms. And so that's where this becomes very nice. Um, there was a long time ago uh, a, a, a pinning mechanism where in helium they float a sphere and they spin it around, they look for direct glitching on that. That's kind of neat. Uh, we're looking for interesting ideas on how to do that inside cold atom systems. Okay. Oh, and another nice thing about helium, which is a little tricky with cold atoms, but imaging technology is getting better and better, is that you can actually put tracer particles in the vortices of helium and you can watch reconnection events and some of the quantum turbulent stuff. Problem with cold atoms is typically when you make measurements, it's destructive, although you can do some partial non-destructive measurements. So anyway, that's advancing technology. All right, um, I'm gonna skip this in the order of time. Uh, we, so cold atoms are very uh, tunable. As Sean mentioned, you can modify dispersions. We did some work where we, using this modified dispersion, found a region of negative curvature. And so that means the effective mass of those particles is negative. And so you get some interesting effects, uh, self-trapping, um, stopping some, but anyway, I won't talk about that right now. Uh, we can ask me about it later. Wow, okay. Uh, but I wanna come back to fermionic superfluids because this is where we have a direct comparison between neutron matter and cold atoms. All right, so this unitary Fermi gas, this is this idealized system, but that can be very well realized in cold atoms where you take two species, you tune the interaction, in this case using a Feshbach resonance, so that the scattering length goes almost to infinity, really large. As I said, the neutron, neutron scattering length is large because of reasons that, yeah, I don't know of any good reasons for that. I've heard of some theories, but it's just the way it is. There's probably some anthropic region too that if it wasn't that way, we wouldn't be here. But anyway, but it is large, so that's also a very good approximation for the unitary Fermi gas. <clears throat> and the neat thing about this is that when you have the, at least the superfluid phase with equal numbers of up and down spins or the two different states, there's no length scale in the problem. The interaction is in the length scale of the interaction is infinite. So everything has to be described in terms of the density. And so your energy density of your system has to go like the density to the five thirds times some factors of H bar and M, et cetera, because those are the only scales involved. Uh, and so, and if you do this at finite temperature, you get one more length scale from the temperature, but you can then describe the pressure as some function, H of T, which is a dimensionless function, times the, the mu over T, so the chemical potential over the temperature to some power. And then you can measure this one universal function. And if you get that, you have the entire thermodynamics of this unitary Fermi gas in terms of one dimensionless function. And then at zero temperature, there's just reduces to one number. And this number is called the Birch parameter. George Birch at UW formulated this problem uh, for nuclear physics. Uh, the, wasn't known at the time whether this state was stable, but it is. And that number would be one if there's no interactions because no interactions also has no length scale. So a non-interacting Fermi gas would be one. And this tells you this is a really strongly interacting system. So the, the interactions reduce this energy down to a factor of uh, 0.37. <clears throat> now, this is kind of an interesting thing. There was a neat competition between classical computer simulations and quantum measurements to determine this number. And they were sort of neck and neck. So we did some variational Monte Carlo calculations that put upper bounds on this number and then experimentalists did measurements. And finally the experimentalists beat us to the actual number, but now there's quantum uh, Monte Carlo calculations that can give you a, an actual number, not just an upper bound. And so this was neck and neck between experiments, which were in some sense, analog class quantum computing and classical computing. Now we're in the state. So this is for the static properties of the system, the equation of state. Uh, and using this, we fit our density functional. If anyone wants to know, you can ask me more details about this later. But we have a very simple density functional. It's simple again, because there's no scales in this problem. So n to the 5 thirds has to appear in there. There's some pairing, et cetera. But this works to the few percent level for all the systems where we have both calculations and measurements. But those are static properties. And uh, oh, yes, one interesting thing about this is our density functional predicts that there should be a supersolid. This is called a larkinov chinnikov full to feral state in this system, which has not yet been seen, but people are trying to look at this. It's hard to see. I can talk more about that later. These types of phases may also exist in neutron stars, although most likely if there's a quark superfluid, and then they provide additional pinning sites too. So this is related to simpler physics there. 
but the interesting thing and the thing we need to do now is to modulate and check to see if we can understand the dynamics of these systems. And so uh, at the time, MIT did this experiment where they put a phase imprint on half of a cigar-shaped cloud that creates a domain wall in the center, and then this domain wall would oscillate back and forth. And they observed this, but they found that the, the, the motion was much, much slower than you'd expect from any theory of domain walls oscillating back and forth. And so this was a puzzle. They thought that this was a, some sort of heavy soliton. And in a sense, it is. Uh, but we simulated this with uh, our density functional. And we found that that domain wall almost immediately decays into a vortex ring. And vortex rings move back and forth much more slowly. So it then explains these results. Unfortunately, the experiments are much larger than we can do these proper fermionic dynamic calculations. And so qualitatively, everything works out. And we think our density functional is correct, but quantitatively, we have not tested it thoroughly yet. And that's where we need some calculations because classical calculations cannot do high precision dynamics, ab initio. They can get static properties with Monte Carlo calculations, um, but to validate the dynamics, we really need something that transcends what's capable with classical computers. And that's where quantum simulations can do something right now. OK. Uh, so people, once you have a theory that you think works, so for weakly interacting bosons, you have a gross Podievsky equation. And even that is hard. People have pushed this to uh, 4,000 cubed lattices. And then they can see these vortices forming in there. And you get turbulence from these. And the vortices are interacting. And then this underlying mechanism of quantum turbulence is produces a hydrodynamic theory with effective viscosity. This is a superfluid, so there's no dissipation in the superfluid itself. But if you coarse grain and treat this like some sort of fluid, these vortices can have entropy and, and they can absorb energy from shock waves on top. And so you get viscous-like effects uh, when you look at the fluid as an effective description. And probably the resolution, if you want to describe this pulsar glitching properly, then what you need to do is have a hydrodynamic theory you can apply over the entire star and then that's connected to the microscopic theory through models and calculations like this. And then you'll look for instabilities in that hydrodynamic theory coupling the different components of the neutron star. OK. <clears throat> Fine. So this is a simulation. Well, it doesn't quite. Uh, the internet connection is not so great. Anyway, we can do simulations with these fermionic theories, which have you know, hundreds of vortices in them, but scaling these up to really large calculations is hard. And what we really need are simulations and quantum experiments to validate that this theory is correct. OK, uh, so here's some work that we've looked at for uh, turbulence. This is with collaborators in Poland. Uh, you can, we've found various ways of imprinting turbulence. And what we find is when you, when you put these vortices in, you get cascades. Large vortices intersect with each other, cut themselves into smaller vortices. You get energy cascading from large scales to small scales, and you get lots of power law behavior. This is seen in the gross Podievsky equation and in these bosonic systems, uh, and we're trying to find out whether the same things happen in fermionic systems, which would be relevant for neutron stars. Um, and you can look at some posters. Kalito Sain has a poster about this up there. OK. Um, so there's a bunch of underlying questions about fermionic turbulence versus bosonic turbulence that we want to understand. Again, these calculations are done with density functionals, which we can work if we have large, large supercomputers, but we need quantum simulation to make sure that those density functionals are doing the right quantum thing. And that's where we need experiments for. OK. Uh, if you're interested in this, there's a lot of information. We hosted a workshop where we brought helium, the helium community, cold atom community, and a bunch of the nuclear physics communities. Uh, the neutron star people, as well as heavy ion collisions. So there's, I put this link in the Google Doc so you can go there and take a look. All of the talks were recorded, and the talks are available online, so you can go and take a look there. There's really a ton of information in this area. All right, so that's what I wanted to say. Uh, lots of help doing this sort of thing. Long term, another challenge with nuclear physics is that we don't know what the microscopic interactions are. Right. Nuclear interactions come down to QCD, quarks interacting with gluons, there's pion exchange. That's a hard problem. That problem maybe could be solved with general purpose quantum simulations, quantum computers in the long term. Uh, maybe we can do, use systems where you make lattice gauge models and use quantum simulation to solve that problem, but that's not going to happen in the next few years. However, right now, cold atom simulations can do direct simulation of dynamics, quantum dynamics, and then we can use that 
to solve and make sure that our density functionals are correct and then use those to calculate the hydrodynamics that we need to see and understand neutron stars. So there's a role right now for quantum simulation in the form of cold atom experiments, uh, helium experiments, et cetera, for solving problems that you can't solve on classical computers. And it can be done now. Lots of other applications too. You've heard lots about that here. Okay, that's it. Let me end by making an advertisement for the next workshop in this series with uh, Northwest Quantum Nexus which will be at Microsoft's reactor building in uh, Seattle on April 23rd. And I'll send in for, oh, you're gonna say more about this. I have no idea. It's a building that they have where, uh, the reactor is to get people together and react. <laughs> I've not been there. Anyway, you'll, you'll all get information about this once uh, the program and everything is settled. Okay, thank you. All right, so questions. <clears throat> Could that uh, analog helium system to the neutron star be done stochastically or does that have to be dynamical? So, well, in principle, you can use stochastic methods to try and do the, I mean, it's essentially Monte Carlo to do the helium, but you don't have control over the dynamics. At least I'm not sure of any theoretical technique that can do dynamics under control. For, for large systems, for small systems, yes, you can do this, of course. But, but okay. you, need, you need a large enough system for vortices to develop, right? And that requires hundreds or thousands of particles. Gotcha. <clears throat> Are we recording? Yes. Oh, okay, that's why we need a microphone, okay. Yes. Um, so I think in the, if I think about helium, I mean, the rather old context, like 50 years ago, in a bucket with, with hot wall boundary condition, those rotating stay very stable, mainly because the, the hot wall boundary condition is actually pretty good to maintain the stability of rotating stay. Uh, of the vortex lattices. Yeah, because yes, the right, 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 right. stuff that, you know, uh, usually it's good. Uh, for the trap or for the neutron star, you talk about the glitch. Yes. Um, so what you'd want to do is you'd want to take your bucket be, yeah. and make sure it has some things that will couple to the vortices and then have your bucket slow down. Yeah. And then as it's slowing down, the vortices would move out. Right? It's taking angular momentum out of the right. system. But I'm saying that in, the, in those bucket situations, once you stop it, the, the, the helium itself rotates. It's a very stable, metal stable. But the buckets are smooth. What? The buckets are smooth, right? So, so in the neutron yeah, star sure. context, it's a, you it's have a smooth, these nuclei as smooth in there. As you can. So my question is, yeah. uh, if you rotate the trap and do the same thing, because the trap, the surface is sort of, it's very gradual, right? I mean, right. It's not a, so what you'd want to do, and actually some, uh, so I think. Um, is, it, is, it, is it easy to lose angular momentum in the Well, you could put an optical that? lattice in. Yeah. Right? And so these, these experiments have been done. You put an incommensurate optical lattice with your, so your vortex lattice is typically a hexagonal. Right or a triangle, you, and then you put like a square lattice on top. You pin them. And, and, and then you can see, because they're incommensurate, there's pinning the effects. Yeah, 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 so you'd want to do something where you put like an optical lattice inside, yeah. or maybe you put a super solid inside, or something that has things that'll pin, because that's how you can interact with yeah. the vortices, yeah. and then have that lose the angular momentum. Okay. That would be sort of the, the, the way of trying to mock this up. A related question, the vortices are quantized in the quantum limit. How much difference it make in terms of turbulence? Because the turbulence can occur without the quantization of vortices. I mean, just in the classical fluid. Oh, you also yeah. So the thing is, so, then so quantization you, itself doesn't make a. So at a macroscopic at scale, I mean, this is sort of the conjecture that you get these regular fluids. You see turbulence again. Right. This cascade. You get these Kolmogorov cascades right. that come from conservation laws. And at a macroscopic scale, you get a very similar behavior. Um, the, the, the plot I showed you with sort of this GPE, you can look at all the different conservation laws at different states. And so macroscopically, quantum turbulence looks a lot like classical turbulence once you take out a few things. You have to do some things to massage them. Um, but, and, and that's actually a thing, that quantum turbulence is sometimes easier to calculate than classical turbulence because you don't have shock phenomena in there. Everything is dis dissipative and smooth. Um, so there are some effects that are similar. Of course, on the microscopic scale, they're very different. 
And so actually characterizing those two is one of the uh, reasons why this whole area of quantum turbulence is If it's a quantized is angular moment can change by steps. Um, is well, that, no, because is the vortices important? move out, right? Yeah. And so as the vortices move out, the angular momentum of the whole system can go smoothly. That, okay, that, that's dependent on boundary condition. I mean, it, yeah. it depends on how you set it. But well, here in your oil case, it's very smooth. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah and traps and a neutron smooth. star has a smooth boundary, so okay. yeah. Right. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Is waffle a type of pasta or I pasta? Don't. No, no, because it's made of flour, but not, not, not the semolina. <laughs> Was there another question? Oh, Ethan? Are you saying I'm waffling? Well, yeah, I had two questions. The first, I was curious whose idea was it to associate certain phases with pasta and if there's any debate on that. Um, the second one, I'm curious, so you mentioned that um, because there's no length scale, the, your energy functional has to have a density to the five halves term. Yes. Is there an intuitive way to understand that? Because five thirds. Five -thirds. Oh, it's, okay. it's just dimensional analysis. Oh, there's, right. If you have equal numbers of up and down, right, then the only parameter is the density of the system. So that gives you a length scale. And the interaction now gives you no other length scale. If it's at zero temperature, then there's no thermal length scale. So there's no other way of making an energy in the system other than n to the 5 thirds times appropriate powers of h bar and m. And that's it. It's just dimensional analysis. So nothing, nothing beyond that. Cool. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Any last questions? OK. So we're ending a little bit early. Thank you to the last two speakers. We have plenty of time. Um, OK, so and actually, everyone was on time. So congratulations to everyone. Let's give our speakers from this session a final round of applause. OK, so what what is